February 29, 2020. China reports 427 new confirmed cases of COVID-19, which brings the total number of cases to over 79,000. 2,835 people have died. A strict lockdown is in place with all non-essential businesses and schools being shut down in the Hubei province. Everyone is asking the same question. Why the fuck is AO3 down? AO3, or Archive of Our Own, is an online platform where users across the world post their fanfiction. It's volunteer run and it's not unheard of for the site to go down for any number of reasons, including just maintenance. So at first glance, the website becoming inaccessible in February of 2020 doesn't seem newsworthy. However, fans quickly realised that the website was only inaccessible in China. Later on that evening, the official AO3 account tweeted, We've investigated, and it's not due to anything on our end. We're keeping Chinese users updated on our Weibo. Immediately, AO3 users in China and across the world begin to suspect that the Chinese government has firewalled AO3, effectively banning the site for the foreseeable future. People were furious. While AO3 was not the only or even maybe the most popular platform for Chinese fans, it served as a place where predominantly female writers and readers could create and consume content that was completely unregulated and therefore uncensored. The loss of AO3 hurts. People lost access to their favorite stories and to stories that they themselves had written. And everyone knew who to blame. Actor Xia Zhan, star of the hit Chinese series The Untamed and his fans. You see, a few days earlier, someone uploaded a new chapter of a queer fanfic centered around the actor. Many of his fans were offended by the fic and reported it to the government and allegedly this caused the site to be firewalled. But the story is so much more than that. To truly understand why AO3 is still banned in China and why that matters, we need to look at the larger story. And spoiler alert, that story includes secret identities, queer-coded rabbits, toxic celebrity culture, hypocritical censorship policies, and an author who may or may not have gone to jail. And it all starts with a little novel called Grand Master of Demonic Cultivation. Before we get fully into it, I just wanna thank today's sponsor, Ritual, the multivitamins that are gluten and major allergen free and based on a visible supply chain so you know where the ingredients are from and why they are there. The Essentials Women Vitamin that I've been taking is designed to support foundational health and includes folate, vitamin B12, and omega-3 DHA, all from vegan sources. It uses a delayed release capsule that can be taken with or without food as it's gentle on your stomach. Rituals pick nutrients that are hard to get from our diets alone and design the multivitamins to fill some of the most common nutrient gaps backed by a university-led clinical study. Plus, it's very conveniently delivered straight to your door. If you aren't sure if Ritual is for you and want to check what results you'll see before you fully commit, they'll refund your money after 30 days, no questions asked if you aren't satisfied. Ritual's offering you all 30% off during your first month. You can scan my QR code on the screen or visit ritual.com forward slash Rowan Ellis 30 and use promo code Rowan Ellis 30 to start today. Okay, back to the video. The book. Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation is a novel by an author known by the pseudonym MXTX. She's never publicly revealed her actual identity and the image on screen is of her social media profile image. Our anonymity will become important later in the video. Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation is an overlap of two genres, Scientia and Dame. Scientia is, as described in one Collider article, a subsection of Chinese fantasy influenced by Taoism and various Chinese mythologies, belief systems, and martial arts. The story is set in a world where humans can transcend the mortal realm by becoming cultivators. Cultivators are spiritual warriors who can fight ghosts, perform exorcisms, and hunt monsters. The plot follows two cultivators, Wei Wuxin and Lang Wanqi, as they solve a string of mysteries that all trace back to a tragic moment in their past. And they aren't just friends or co-workers, they are soulmates. And that brings me to the second genre. Danmei is a Chinese genre of romantic literature in which the primary romance is between two men or two male coded characters. That's right, Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation is a gay romance. And I don't mean, you know, all the vibes are gay. This is explicitly queer. And you might be wondering, doesn't China have gay censorship policies and a ban on pornography? How is this gay erotica even legal? Well, it's complicated. Most Danmei novels, even ones without graphic sex scenes, are 
either illegal outright or in a legal grey area, thanks to the many anti-pornography and anti-LGBTQ plus censorship policies. But just because a law exists doesn't mean that it gets enforced consistently. Dame novels are typically web novels, uploaded chapter by chapter onto websites like Qianzhang Literature City. As of now, Qianzhang Literature City has over 7 million registered users and over 500,000 titles, one of which is Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation. It, like a lot of Dame works, wasn't actually censored in mainland China, even as it grew increasingly popular and MXDX began to profit off her work. Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation became so successful that it became a print novel in China and internationally. You can buy this book in Waterstones. As of 2023, it's been translated into 11 different languages. Not only that, but she got a TV deal, right? It was adapted into the TV series The Untamed. And believe it or not, this isn't the first time a Dan May web novel has become a TV show. It's actually pretty common practice. Adapted titles include Immortality, Winner is King, Word of Honor, Guardian, Killer and Healer, Dreamcatcher, Advance Bravely, Till Death Tear Us Apart, I Could Keep Going. Since 2016, it has quite literally been illegal to portray gay people on TV in China. And so these adaptations undergo a heavy straight washing policy. The male love interest becomes a platonic friend, for example. While there may be a subtextual vibe that fans can pick up on between the two male leads, there can be no explicit romance or sexual moments between them. The mainstream success of Dan May adapted shows, the international release of The Untamed, may make some people think that there's no real risk in these authors writing these queer novels, but that's not always the case. Waves of anti-porn crackdowns in 2004, 2010 and 2014 have specifically targeted Dan May websites and forums, permanently shutting many down. Dan May authors and site owners can and have gone to jail for their role in creating and distributing queer erotica. In 2017, a year after MXTX wrote Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation, one writer was arrested and sentenced to 10 years in prison for her Dan May novel Occupy. The police described the book as containing obscene sexual behaviour between males. There have been other unverified reports of similar incidents, including a Dan May website with over 1,200 titles being shut down in 2011 and the founder of the site being sentenced to 18 months in prison and a fine. In fact, some people believe that MXTX herself went to jail for writing Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation and other Dan May works. In May 2019, an author with the last name Yuan was arrested and imprisoned for the distribution of obscene material. The author was described as a well-known writer for Xianjiang Literature City. Apparently, MXTX's real name is Yuan. During Yuan's imprisonment, MXTX's online presence was non-existent. But then, a few days after they were released, MXTX's account suddenly became active again. For a lot of people speculating online, this was as good as proof that the two were one and the same. However, this is a very common last name, and the company has tens of thousands of signed authors. The online period of silence could well have been her taking a social media break or focusing on new projects. A month or so after Yuan was released from jail, it was announced that MXTX had added over 100,000 words to her other Dan May work. Perhaps most importantly, neither MXTX or anyone who knows her has said publicly that she went to jail. I think it's important to note here that we're dealing with a country which has enacted censorship policies about someone who is chosen to remain anonymous and the conversation around this aspect of the story, just the simple question of whether or not this person indeed went to prison, is so mired in different sides, people fully believing that their version of events is 100% true, with neither side necessarily holding a ton of evidence either way. Like for some people, this is just a funny internet meme. It's a joke and it's hilarious that people still believe that this person went to jail. And for the people on the other side, it is an obvious connection of potential facts, a lot of circumstantial evidence, which seems maybe naive to dismiss. And this debate over whether MXTX did in fact go to jail is pretty controversial and heated across social media, including Twitter, Reddit, and Tumblr. But I feel like this potentially distracts from the bigger issue here, which is that somebody did go to jail. You and whoever they are served a jail sentence for writing and distributing a gay love story. And a month after Yuen's arrest, The Untamed, the TV adaptation of a Dan May novel, premiered to millions, billions in fact, of viewers. The show.
The book and the show are actually pretty closely matched in terms of their general setup and plot, with some changes to make characters less morally grey than in the book, or swapping out one MacGuffin object for another, or, you know, removing the explicit queer sex and replacing it with no homo best bro soulmates instead. Wei Wuxian is a cultivator, a practitioner of martial or mystical arts, who ends up mixed up in some supposedly dark and demonic practices. More than a decade after his death, he's resurrected and reunited with the people in his old life, including his literal soulmate Lang Wang Ji. When he's resurrected, he ends up inhabiting the body of a man who brought him back, but his soulmate is able to recognize him. It's a classic I would find you in any universe vibe that these boys are bringing here. They work together to navigate the war between clans, solve some mysteries, and figure out what happened all those years ago. There are lots of beautiful swishy robes. There are a bunch of online primers with information about the show for beginners who want to get into it, and one in particular had a great TLDR bullet point summary that I will link below. The storm cloud one is soft for the sunshine one. So, so gay. Warfare. Also zombies. Swishy robes. Extra. Genuinely, so extra. Like, even if you came up watching soap operas, this show is still very fucking extra. Content warning, suicide, violence and genocide against refugees, one instance of killing a child, non-graphic torture. Also, I think it's very fun to note that the supposedly dark and demonic one is the Sunshine character. The show is pretty prolific, with 50 episodes in total and fans all over the world. It's one of China's most popular live action speculative and historical drama series. The changes from book to show are most pointed in the removal of canonical queerness from its leads. Many critics and commentators, however, have pointed out the subtextual elements that remain, particularly those that tap into existing Chinese romantic tropes and illusions. Writer Michelle Kirichanskaya explains, Wei Wuxian and Lang Wangji almost exclusively refer to each other by their birth names, a courtesy granted to those who are emotionally familiar with each other. Wei Wuxian constantly touches Lan Wangxi's headband, a symbol of his clan that bears significant meaning in that it can only be touched by its wearer's fated one or family. The show includes scenes lifted wholesale from the book that in their original context are explicitly romantic, including bows often marked in traditional marriage ceremonies, or the many inclusions of rabbits within the show, which many Chinese fans noted with a deep LGBTQ plus significance, as the rabbit is seen as a symbol of queerness, referring to the rabbit god, a Chinese god guardian of homosexual relationships. With these allusions added to the general rules of fandom that if you give them two male characters in a show, they will ship them, it's no surprise that fans of the show began to see the romantic potential in these two characters. Imagine their delight when they checked out the source material and discovered that this wasn't wishful thinking on their part, but based in the reality of the original author's intentions. How far the creators and writers of the show we're interested in hinting at a romantic relationship is unclear, as it often is with media that removes explicit queerness, but either way, many people in the fan base ran with this ship. Although the show itself is canonically straight, it's important to note that much of the popularity stemmed not from the straight washing, but in spite of it. Swaves of the audience connected with it in a queer way, were intrigued by this homoromantic soulmate trope and were validated in their discovery of the source material. Parasocial relationships. The actors were far from unknown at the start of the show, but the impact of the series skyrocketed them to superstar levels. To understand what happened next, you have to understand the fan culture and economy in China. Huge, engaged fandoms are in existence all over the world, including toxic subgroups and parasocial relationships. But the Chinese idol fan relationship model has arguably become a unique symbiotic system. It's been facilitated by social media platforms where fans, as academics Xin Yan and Fan Yong explain, co-cultivate their idols, including their public images, the scope of their work, and even their personal lives, rather than just supporting or admiring them from a distance. Theories around the origins of these fandom structures often cite the specific circumstances of fans who, according to writers like journalist Marianne Zhou, grew up with material wealth, relentless advertising, and social media, but few outlets for self-expression. The modern of nationwide fandoms in the country is often spoke about as a pursuit of a distinctly middle or upper class identity. Those who were the first to gain access to the internet, especially students who are frequent users of internet cafes. Others discuss the role loneliness plays in development of virtual parasocial relationships, or the potential results of the knowledge that missteps in an idol's public image can have serious consequences, leading to a feeling of responsibility in fans to ensure the subject of their interest is without repute. The intensity of these fandoms has led 
some celebrity managements to hire existing influential players in fandoms as professional fans to lead activations, steer the fandoms in the right direction with online activities, and manage the sway of public opinion. This also gives a communication route from the fans back to management, and this multi-layered web of relationships between celebrities, their representation, various kinds of fans, and the public outside of the fandom itself is complex. An analyst of China's fan economy at Film Intelligence, a Chinese market research group has noted. It's complicated because professional fans and VIP fans are not machines. They have their own desires and chain of interests, but they're seen as one group. If any one department makes a mistake, the celebrity is responsible in the public's eyes. Reporting to authorities has become a common way for fans to sabotage a celebrity nowadays. It's not right and should not be encouraged. And there is big, big money in the Chinese fan economy. Online engagement drives advertising figures as part of the background noise of the internet, but it's more focused too. The ARPU approach, meaning average revenue per user, is often used in the Chinese music industry, for example, to measure the value of an artist. Not just how popular a musician is, but how likely each fan is to generate high revenue for the management. Of the estimated 500 million people in China reportedly willing to spend money on an idol, 36% are willing to spend $15 to $75 per month this way. In return, they gain a level of emotional satisfaction and emotional capital, a connection to the community, and a sense of contributing to the success of the artist. This spending is not necessarily on the product the celebrity themselves is producing, like a movie or an album, but companies they are being sponsored by. As journalist Aja Romano reports, the biggest stars have lucrative corporate partnerships, with some holding over 30 or 40 brand contracts at once. These corporations fully market the star as much as their own product. Many brands organize live streams and fan events for their idols. Companies also often release teaser trailers for the big reveal of their new brand spokesperson, ensuring that the reveal itself is an event. In 2019, before all of this happened, Xiao Jian himself was announced as a brand ambassador for Estee Lauder just before Singles Day, the world's largest online shopping festival. Their sales exceeded $6.2 million in a single hour. Professor Kim Rando coined the term for this in 2020, fansumer, a fan consumer who is highly involved in every aspect of the fan economy. When spending money is a sign of fan devotion, the worst thing to be is a bai piao, someone who claims to be a fan yet won't spend money or engage with votes or contests for their idol online, a term which has an original meaning of attempting to solicit a prostitute for free. This financial investment only serves to heighten, and is in turn increased by, the parasocial relationships between many celebrities and their fans. Parasocial interactions are one-sided relationships where someone will feel a connection with and extend emotional energy to a figure who doesn't really know of their existence. Most often this happens with celebrities and public figures, particularly those who share their lives or personality online, like YouTubers. Because viewers of vlogs, for example, see someone's everyday existence. It feels intimate. You see their home life and personality in a way that, in decades past, you would only get from hanging out with a friend in person. Except obviously, it's not responsible. Reciprocal. One study into parasocial relationships concluded, through frequent media exposure, audiences come to feel that they know a celebrity from their appearance, gestures, conversations, and conduct, despite having no direct communication with them. This is far from unique to Chinese fans, but studies have found a greater link between fan engagement and an artist's perceived morality and behavior than even the artist's talents in Chinese fandom. It's this combination of emotional and economic investment from fans with a sense of responsibility to protect the idol's image that feels unique in many ways, and undoubtedly influenced what happened in 2020. The fanfic. This complex relationship between fans and fame is a key piece of context for what happened next. A fan fiction was posted online. This itself isn't unusual. I just checked and 500 new MCU fics were updated on AO3 yesterday alone. There are almost 50,000 fics for the Untamed on AO3 right now. But something about this fic caught a lot of people's attention. The fic in question is called Falling, centering around not the characters within the Untamed, but an alternate universe version of the two lead actors. This kind of fanfic is called RPF, or real person fiction, and its particular story was very much outside of the actors' real personal lives casting them as a high school student and a sex worker who, depending on the source and um, reading of the story, is either a trans woman, a cross-dressing man, or identifying with some other experience of gender dysphoria. AU fics are pretty common, and RPF fics, while not the majority of fan fiction, also isn't necessarily particularly noteworthy. Whether or not RPF fics are okay to write and publish and consume is a whole internet debate that I won't get into here, 
maybe in one of my upcoming videos about fan fiction I will but just know that these two things are not necessarily ridiculously unusual. The fic was posted on AO3 and Chinese blogging site Lofter and was tagged in a pretty typical way for fanfiction, giving information about the age rating of the story and some detail as to its content. In this case, it was rated mature and was clear that it involved an underage character, that being the fictional 17-year-old version of Wang Yi Bo. The other characters that appear in the story seem to be original characters of the author's own design. A post about the fic went up on Chinese social media site Weibo and it self-inspired fan art that was also posted on online, and this combination of the gender exploration themes and fan art that anyone could see and react to much easier than having to read a multi-chapter story to decide their reaction, sparked backlash from fans of Xiao Chan. To them, the fic was an insult to the actor, casting him in a degrading light, particularly the portrayal of him, however removed from reality the story was, as too feminine and perverse. To others, the blame lay at the feet of the actor himself for not doing enough to control the fans writing stories like this, or conversely, for not doing enough to control fans who were rallying a backlash against said stories, because that backlash moved fast. The Timeline to give you an idea of just how fast, it's time to look at the actual timeline of events. Here's what happened. On February 24th of 2020, a popular Untamed fan shared a post about the aforementioned fic that encouraged people to read it. The fic gained traction with a rush of new readers and artists creating fan art for it. Xiao Jian's solo fans, known as XFX, take offence to the depiction of their idol, claiming that it tarnishes his reputation to depict him as a prostitute, especially one who is queer. Two days later, on February 26th, Sixth, two XFX fans start a campaign to report AO3 to the state in order to get the site, and therefore the offensive fic, taken down. Since the Chinese firewall is automated, if enough people reported AO3, the ban will be automatic. The author of Falling locks her fic on Lofter, but leaves it on AO3. The next day, February 27th, fanfic readers and writers outside of the Untamed fandom join the Xiao Shipper fans and form the 227 Union, an inter-fandom collective with the sole purpose of fighting the XFX XFX campaign and preventing AO3 from getting firewalled. XFX fans double down on their campaign, arguing that it's more important to protect the image and reputation of the actor than to have access to fan fiction. On February 28th, the 227 Union retaliate by crashing a live stream for one of his sponsored brands, Olay. They spammed the chat, bashed the actor, and threatened a boycott of any product he endorses. A rumor spreads that the author of Falling was doxxed by XFX and reported her university, and this increased is the outrage of 227 Union. On February 29th, mainland China loses access to AO3. 227 Union concludes that it was a direct result of the XFX campaign. Angered, AO3 fans decide to review bomb any product associated with the actor and begin a boycott of any product that he's ever endorsed, flooding pages with one-star reviews and review bombing any piece of media that he's ever performed in. On March 1st, the actor's label, Xiaojian Studios, releases an official statement apologizing for occupying public public resources during the pandemic and encouraging everyone to stay safe. The XFX who started the campaign also apologises, claiming she didn't want the campaign to affect other fandoms, and reportedly a handful of AO3 users and Xiaojian fans allegedly start posting suicide notes on Weibo. Hashtag we love you Xiaojian starts trending on Twitter, which is itself not accessible in mainland China. International fans, solo and shippers alike, use the hashtag to express their concern about the backlash against the actor. Meanwhile, the author of Fallen posts on Lofter that she wasn't doxxed or reported to her university. She wrote, Continuing to spread false information about me is likely to further intensify the conflict. Personally, I don't want this tit-for-tat, eye-for-eye confrontation between groups to continue. That same day, a new internet censorship law goes into effect. The law prohibits insulting or slandering others, infringing on others' reputation, privacy, or other legitimate rights and interests, and posting anything that encourages minors to imitate unsafe behaviors, violate public morals, or induce bad habits. Two days later, on March 3rd, AO3 confirms that the block is on China's end. The next day, on March 4th, Xiaojian Studios confirms that several of his social media accounts were hacked, presumably by fans affiliated with 227 Union. Companies have started to take down promotional images of him on their websites. On March 6th, Ole is mass reported to the China Consumers Association and falls under investigation by tax authorities. It's strongly suspected that it was 227 Union who mass reported the brand. On April 21st, Xiaojian Studios posts a statement announcing that they are pursuing legal action against the anti Xiao fans for spreading false claims and slander. On April 27th, the parent company of Xiaojian Studio, 
allegedly pays Weber to delete posts and accounts of high-profile boycotters. On May 6th, Xiao Zhan gives a video interview directly addressing the scandal for the first time. Later, he says, To the people who like and support me, I hope they won't do anything so extreme that they would hurt others or hurt themselves. He also apologizes for old Weibo posts that anti-fans dredged up in their smear campaign. However, he disagrees with the suggestion that idols should be responsible for their fans' behavior. On July 5th, Weibo shuts down several fan accounts in the 227 Union, and on July 14th, they post that influential people, including idols, are obligated to manage fan behavior. They announce that they've reached out to Xiaojian Studios and that they've agreed that they will cooperate in managing fan behavior in the future. In a Weibo post, Xiaojian Studio states that they will actively guide fans calling for a stop to the promotion of hate and will cooperate with the platform to maintain a healthy online environment. This is considered a reversal of the actor's previous stance on an idol's responsibility to fans and vice versa. The Aftermath it's been three years since AO3 was firewalled in China, and now that the dust has settled, we can see the results of this months-long online battle. What happened to Xiao Zhang? Was his career ruined? Well, to put it bluntly, um, no. According to an article in Style, the singer and actor currently has over 31 brand sponsorships and over 31 million followers on Weibo. A media service platform analyzed his fan following and concluded that the purchasing power of Xiao's fans is so strong that brands can earn back their investment in just five hours and double it to equal revenue within a day. So yeah, his career is fine. However, the political role of Chinese idols has shifted as a result of China's 2021 fandom restrictions. The restrictions significantly altered the dynamics of fandom, holding idols directly responsible for their fan base's behavior and inversely making fans directly responsible for not making their idols look bad. Crucially, it also co-opted celebrities to be agents of the state. So what happened to MXTX? In 2023, she gave an interview with a Japanese magazine. I read a fan translation of the interview online, and in it, MXTX seems to be doing pretty well. She doesn't discuss any of the political drama surrounding The Untamed or her novels. She never mentions the jail rumors. What she does talk about is her art. She discusses her books, her creative process, and how much she loves writing. The first story I completed was a schoolyard romance story during my secondary school. Even though it was just a work in progress draft, it still got some of my classmates really riled up. I also want to be a character in this story. I want to be in the same team as this heroine. I got a lot of requests like this. I looked at my classmates' excitement and admiration for my story and felt so happy. As a result, my old notes are filled with old and complete stories. If I have a chance in the future, I'd like to complete them. According to the interview, she's still writing, but because her creative process is slow, she isn't going to drop another book anytime soon. MXTX seems okay, but it's unlikely she'll be able to get another TV adaptation of her works anytime soon because uh, there's also been a crackdown on Dan Mei adaptations. In 2021, China banned live action adaptations of Dan Mei novels. Over 50 adaptations that were already in production or ready to air have been reportedly halted. And it's not just the more successful authors that have been impacted by this new wave of censorship. There's been a significant increase in Dan Mei web novels being reported, locked and taken down. And in an unfortunate twist, it's fans, not the state, that are enforcing most of these restrictions. According to an article about the new policy in Vox, a recently published study from researchers at Concordia University and York University conducted between January 2020 and October 2021 looked at the way Dan May fans online interacted with the CCP's restrictions. They found that in the absence of clarity around many of the restrictions, the fans themselves, through a mix of speculation and accusatory reporting, that is, reporting or threatening to report each other to authorities for perceived transgressions, were doing a more efficient job policing themselves than the government ever could. In essence, the fans who try to conduct their subversive fandoms within the parameters of the regime strengthen the political authorities' practice and narrative. It's a catch-22. If fans don't report specific fix, there's a possibility that the entire forum or site could be shut down. But this vigilante-style censorship can quickly turn toxic. Not only does it censor queer erotica, it provides an opportunity for fans to report fix that have ships they don't like, or feature tropes they don't like, or just contain political messages that they don't like. The analysis. So where does this leave us? Moral character analysis and so-called cancel culture is a part of fandom all over the world. The targets of this campaign in particular seem misguided at best. 
One, the fans of the actor wanting to protect his image, who went after the website hosting the fic, and two, the fans of the site wanting to protect access to it and wider issues of freedom of expression, who went about it by targeting a man with little to nothing to do with it. In either case, fans saw it as a kind of ethical obligation, a moral mission, a method of protection either for the actor or against the website blocking. It became about principles, whether freedom of speech or traditional sexual morality, a mix of public showmanship of your ethical practice and communal justification for your actions, which ultimately changed very little in the long run, because at the end, what are we left with? The actor is still wealthy, famous and breaking in sponsorships and AO3 is still banned. The story is ultimately about an actor, an author and a fic writer, none of whom are reported to identify as queer publicly. We obviously don't know people's sexualities and how they identify in private, but the public discourse around this story is a straight woman writing homoerotic books that is straight washed by censors to star straight actors and subsequently a straight fic writer creating mature fan fiction around said actors. This public distance means it becomes a lot about hypotheticals. The straight washing is an unfortunate deviation from the artistic vision of a writer. The explicit nature of the book and fan fiction become a political battleground for a debate about censorship and freedom of speech for fans who have fictional genre. Western journalists write articles about this strange thing that happened in China and include paragraphs citing the standard line from Hollywood about a lack of queer characters in mainstream movies being about appeasing the Chinese market. And all the while, thoughts of the actual experiences of queer Chinese people are too often missing. The idea that an effeminate fictional version of an actor in a story might damage his reputation sounds on the surface ridiculous. But as reports from the wave of policies in 2021 demonstrate, this comes from very real attitudes that affect the daily lives of LGBTQ plus people in the country. Broadcasters must resolutely put an end to sissy men and other abnormal aesthetics, the TV regulator said, using an insulting slam term for effeminate men. Last year, LGBT societies at several universities saw their social media accounts closed for unspecified violations. Groups pushing for more inclusion have shut down, with members citing an increasingly hostile environment. June is celebrated as Pride Month in parts of the world, but China's only big LGBT celebration, Shanghai Pride, has not occurred since 2020, when police interrogated several of its organisers. A national survey conducted in 2015 by the UN Development Programme among some 28,000 LGBTQ plus individuals in China revealed that only 5% of them chose to disclose their sexual orientation, gender identity or gender expression at school or in the workplace, fearing discrimination. Sam Chen, an assistant professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and co-chair of the International Communication Association LGBTQ plus studies interest group has reported. What has happened in the last one or two years is an obvious targeted suppression of LGBTQ themed activities. The LGBTQ movement and the hashtag MeToo movement are an unfortunate target set up by the nationalists to solidify their sense of Chineseness. In the West, idealization of celebrities can often mean excusing misbehavior and there are still elements of this in Chinese fandom, but the opposite is also true, placing the blame for fan behaviour on the shoulders of their idols, regardless of their involvement with the original issue. How far can we hold public figures responsible for the actions of their supporters? Should they have an obligation to acknowledge or condemn this bad behaviour? Or is it better to distance themselves from fans that they haven't chosen who behave poorly? A lot of the reporting of this story treats Chinese fandom as unique, not in terms of its structure or history, but in terms of its actions. Crazy fans who got a website banned, those unhinged haters who tried to destroy an innocent man's career, that this is some foreign extreme phenomenon that we can look at from a distance, but we know that's not true, right? If you go on TikTok and scroll for a while, I guarantee you'll see people stitching videos and beginning with the phrase, please don't send hate to this creator, because they've seen it happen so many times before. I've seen countless people online criticize public figures for not doing enough to stop their followers from doing any number of negative actions from harassment to spreading rumors, holding them accountable for the behavior of any stranger who acts in their name. And so to you watching this right now in the UK or the US or Europe, it's vitally important to react to these stories with empathy and not superiority. Because there should have been moments listening to this story where you notice similarities to what is going on here right now. Fans aiming frustrations in the wrong direction, homophobic and transphobic policies, straight washing adaptations, speculation about actor sexuality that turns invasive. This isn't a story about a uniquely wild thing that happened in a strange and distant land. Queer media from Sailor Moon to Stephen Universe has been straight washed in Western countries for decades. 
Every month there's a new queer censorship bill or law being put in place in the US state. Literally last month, my book was removed from the Young V&A Museum in London, along with another book and a poster on display, seemingly because of their trans inclusive content. If you spent any amount of time during the run of this video feeling dismayed or outraged or affronted by the actions of any of the players involved in it, I suggest looking at the ways that you might be able to affect change in the communities where you live and spend time. Turn up to local meetings and vote against book bans. Work to create fan community spaces that are free from homophobic and transphobic harassment and support queer media and creators because God knows we need it. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any thoughts about what we've covered here today, then please put them in the comments. And if you'd like to support the work that I do on YouTube and beyond, then I will leave a link to my Patreon in the description. If you want to check it out along with all of my social media, so you can find me all over the internet. And of course, another big thank you to today's sponsor, Ritual. I will leave my personalized link in the description for you to use and the promo code if you would like 30% off your first month.